Hi, my name is Dr. Ryan Flanagan from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker, Dr. Peter Schlegel from Weill Cornell Medicine in New York. Dr. Schlegel is a James J. Colt Professor of Urology and Reproductive Medicine and has numerous accolades to his name. To name a few, he was awarded the 1996 Established Clinician Award by the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology. He received the Behringer Medal of the American Association of Genital Urinary Surgeons in 2012, and he was inducted into John Hopkins Society of Scholars in 2007. It is no doubt that Dr. Schlegel has been a pioneer in the field of male infertility. He has developed and published on the surgical technique called microdissection testicular sperm extraction, or microtessie, which has advanced the field's ability to successfully retrieve sperm in patients with sperm production abnormalities, such as Klinefelter syndrome. He has made numerous seminal contributions and published more than 300 papers pertaining to microsurgical treatment, hormones, and genetics of male infertility. We have the pleasure today to hear his presentation entitled Fertility in Klinefelter Syndrome. Dr. Schlegel, over to you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this conference. I wanna talk a little bit about our experience in the management of Klinefelter syndrome, particularly the ability to try to preserve fertility or allow fertility treatment and how that relates to assisted reproduction. I do wanna mention that a couple of agents that I may talk about, drugs such as HCG, anastrozole, clomiphene, testolactone, are gonna be off-label uses, meaning I'm using these as a standard medical practice under a, an indication that is not FDA approved. I also wanna mention that I do receive funding from Roman Health, bearing pharmaceuticals or Theralogics, or at least I have within the past year. None of those um, support areas have anything to do with the presentation that I'm giving today. Everyone here knows that Klinefelter syndrome is both rare as well as one of the most common uh, genetic abnormalities. Most men have 47 XXY, although mosaic forms of Klinefelters are also possible. And many of the men who have this condition are actually not diagnosed during their life. It can be a somewhat different presentation, meaning men may present in very different ways, but they're also metabolic, hormonal, and in some cases, some risks of cancers that exist as a consequence of Klinefelter's. There are certainly developmental or behavioral characteristics that may be associated with Klinefelter's as well. I'm gonna to focus today primarily on fertility and fertility preservation in this talk. In general, Klinefelter syndrome usually results in significant problems with how the testis works. The testis, of course, functionally is supposed to produce sperm as well as produce testosterone. And the testes start to develop fairly normally, but then they change. There tends to be a fair bit of scarring of the sperm making areas of the testicle referred to as the seminiferous tubules and characteristically, adult men have smaller testes and relatively low testosterone. Most, nearly all adult men have no sperm in the ejaculate, what we call azospermia. And it appears that the sperm making cells or germ cells are actually lost fairly early during puberty. Since sperm production can be present in early adolescence, it is important to consider a semen analysis early in that period of development. This is just a series of biopsy pictures that compare what we usually see in the normal developing male to what is typically seen in Klinefelter syndrome. And although they appear relatively similar, both in fetal and uh, childhood samples, as young men go through puberty, there tends to be more scarring shown as this pink color within the biopsies relative to what is normally seen during puberty in the otherwise unaffected uh, male testis. And again, 
during full development. These areas here are just hormone making cells com almost completely replacing the normal sperm making areas of the testicle. So during this transition, it is of significant interest to us in terms of what's occurring from a fertility standpoint, because what happens going into adolescence appears to determine what happens in the adult testis as well. As I said, men with 47XXY rarely have sperm in the ejaculate. And when sperm are present, they tend to be in very small numbers so in vitro fertilization or assisted reproductive treatments are needed for fertility. In vitro fertilization is really a treatment of a woman. It involves stimulating egg production instead of the normal one egg that is produced per month, multiple eggs are produced. Then those eggs are retrieved or taken out usually going through the vagina and just drawing uh, fluid and the eggs out of the body. And that allows the eggs outside of the body to be injected with as little as one sperm per egg. So effectively that allows us to take men who have very, very limited sperm production and use those sperm to uh, initiate pregnancies. So IVF, in vitro itself refers to in glassware or outside the body, sperm and eggs are being brought together outside the body. One of the adjunctive treatments to uh, IVF is what we call ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. It's taking an individual sperm and injecting it into each egg. And again, that allows men with even single numbers of sperm to have a chance of pregnancy and fatherhood. We refer to IVF and ICSI together as forms of assisted reproduction or assisted reproductive technologies or ART. So for adult males, in cases where no sperm are present in the ejaculate, we have developed surgical techniques to retrieve or find the very rare sperm that can be identified within the testis and then use those sperm with ICSI or the single sperm injection process. For men to have sperm appear in the ejaculate, typically you have to be making several million sperm before the first one comes out. So it's not unusual for men with azospermia, absolute lack of sperm in the ejaculate to still have some rare sperm within the testicle. And again, sperm retrieval with ICSI is effective to allow fertility for adult male patients. We were actually were able to demonstrate that and publish it in medical literature. Unfortunately, the ability to retrieve sperm and effectively use them varies substantially at different centers around the country and the world. And there are a series of subtle differences in how centers approach treatment of men in this situation that makes it more difficult. In terms of fertility treatment for adult males, in those cases where no sperm are present in the ejaculate, surgical sperm retrieval from the testis is possible, and those sperm can be used as single sperm injected into eggs during the IVF process. And that's called sperm retrieval with sperm retrieval with ICSI, the intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Ability to retrieve sperm varies substantially at different centers around the country and around the world. And that relates to the subtle differences in terms of surgical technique, different experience at individual laboratories, and different success that you get from different IVF centers. So unfortunately, it matters significantly where you have this type of attempted treatment. From a hormonal standpoint, there are several important considerations. Sperm production within the testicle is driven by the local production of testosterone inside the testicle. If testosterone is low in the circulation, 
testosterone can be given systemically as shots or gels, for example, to allow men to have normal testosterone levels. But it's critical for fertility for internal or endogenous testosterone production to be enhanced. So exogenous testosterone, those shots or gels, tends to stop internal testosterone production. So giving testosterone can oppose sperm production and fertility. We have attempted medical therapy, different treatments to improve sperm production before surgical sperm retrieval. Unfortunately, there is also a balance because testosterone is often given exogenously in Klinefelter patients to enhance neurobehavioral features or development. So these two uh, approaches can act against each other. External testosterone suppresses sperm production and substantially lowers the surgical sperm retrieval rate for men, even if they have had testosterone treatment in the past in our experience. And again, this reflects the importance of having testosterone production within the testicle to enhance fertility. Another feature of low testosterone is that low testosterone may not be just low production, it can be excess metabolism or breakdown of testosterone to estrogens or estradiol. This is a process called aromatization. It is measured by the testosterone to estradiol ratios and there is increased breakdown or conversion of testosterone to estrogens or female hormones as men age, as the testicle works worse in terms of sperm production, and particularly in men with Klinefelter syndrome. So medical therapy in Klinefelters often involves use of a aromatase inhibitor, a drug that prevents that conversion of testosterone to estrogen. In the past, we used drugs like testolactone. Now we more commonly use anastrozole, but some features of anastrozole are tricky. Sometimes anastrozole tends to have less effect over time, a phenomenon we call tachyphylaxis. We also can use clomiphene citrate to trick the body to make more testosterone. It is uh, limited in terms of the data that we have for how well this works in Klinefelter syndrome, but it does appear in some men to increase testosterone and therefore stimulation of the testicle for sperm production. We often also use a combination of drugs like HCG and anastrozole together, and that can work even if the initial testosterone levels are extremely low. We have also seen that the response to these medical treatments helps to predict which men will have sperm retrieved. So if we look at the baseline testosterone levels and normal levels would be over 300 nanograms per deciliter, those men with Klinefelters where we're able to find sperm or the men with Klinefelters where we can't find sperm have relatively similar levels of testosterone at baseline. But for those men where medical treatment causes the testosterone level to come up to a more normal range, there is a much greater likelihood of finding sperm than if the testosterone does not respond as well. That does not always mean that the medical treatment is causing the improvement in sperm production. It may be related to other characteristics of the testicle itself. So generally, our approach has been to go ahead and treat men with low testosterone before sperm retrieval and IVF to try to normalize abnormal levels of testosterone. We consider that balance of testosterone and estrogens in terms of what medications we use. Often men with Klinefelters respond best to HCG and anastrozole as combined treatment. You only need a couple of months for that treatment to work and we follow testosterone levels during medical treatment in preparation for sperm retrieval. Now, sperm retrieval involves getting into the testicle and trying to find these areas of the testicle 
the seminiferous tubules that are rare that are making sperm. We know in general, the testicle doesn't work normally. There are relatively limited areas of the testicle making sperm shown schematically by these black lines. The sites of sperm production are not predictable and sperm production may be present throughout the tubule, although we often find in men with Klinefelter syndrome that they're focal perhaps even one or two millimeter sections of these tubules that are the ones making sperm. Microscopically during the uh, operation, that is using an operating microscope, the tissues that have very fine tubules are tissues that typically don't have sperm. The typicals that are larger, whiter, and more opaque, those are the ones that typically have sperm as suggested on this photomicrograph looking at a biopsy section. The surgery requires going deep within the testicle, which is a process that has to be done very carefully, but it is done anatomically, meaning the, the tubules that produce sperm go parallel to the blood vessels within the testicle. That allows us to search many, many different areas of the testicle and find even rare areas where sperm production is present. We also find that the usual measures like FSH hormone that typically predicts how well a testicle is working, FSH levels really don't predict how likely we are to find sperm. So these are sperm retrieval rates shown in these red bars. And you can see regardless of whether the FSH level is very high or is closer to normal, you can have very good levels of sperm production and chances of finding sperm with a micro or surgical approach searching within the testicle. One question is, can you just take sperm and freeze them? Well, freezing sperm is certainly an easier approach because you can do that at any time. And then a woman could go through IVF even days, weeks, months, or years later. So sperm retrieval together with IVF is logistically challenging. And many centers will just use frozen sperm. And some literature even suggests that it's equivalent if you freeze sperm or use them fresh. But very often we find that men with rare sperm don't have enough to actually freeze the sperm. Sometimes the sperm doesn't survive freezing and thawing. And in our experience, you also have lower pregnancy rates if you freeze the sperm or intentionally cryopreserve sperm after surgery or this TESI testicular sperm extraction procedure. In our experience, up to 70% of men who have sperm from surgery may have sperm lost or not viable after um, they are frozen and thawed. For Klinefelter syndrome treatment, clearly sperm is the limited resource. Up to 70% of men have sperm in the testis, despite the lack of sperm in the ejaculate. Those sperm tend to fertilize eggs at a relatively low rate, even using that single sperm injection. And often that means we have a limited number of embryos that we can actually use to put back into the woman or transfer into the uterus to allow pregnancies to occur. And that changes the approach that's used for in vitro fertilization that's going to be considered at the centers where such treatment is provided. So we are successful in the majority of adult men with Kleinfelters who are interested in having children, we can get sperm and use them with IVF. What about the adolescent? What have we learned and what applies in that situation? Well, as I alluded to before, there's a suggestion from biopsy studies that sperm production may decrease probably soon after spermarche, which for most men is the start of sperm production, typically at age 12, 13, 14. So looking early at those young men to consider fertility preservation is worthwhile. We will often, even though it's sometimes an uncomfortable discussion with kids and with parents as well, will sometimes be able to get a semen analysis and freeze some rare sperm that are present 
at 12, 13, or 14 that may not be present later. One question is, should we go in with surgery early and try to freeze sperm? Limitations of that early intervention is that again, sperm do not always survive freezing and thawing effectively. Pregnancy rates may be lower with those frozen sperm. The real question is, do we do better in sperm retrieval at adolescence or when the patient is an adult? It's also important to remember that testosterone monotherapy, meaning testosterone treatment alone, decreases sperm production and should be avoided for males interested in fertility. Adverse effects of testosterone can be limited, though, by using testosterone with another agent, such as anastrozole or HCG. In one small trial we did here at Weill Cornell, we used testosterone gel as well as anastrozole and then did sperm retrieval during adolescence and found that seven out of 10, 70% of those kids had sperm that were able to be retrieved. That number, unfortunately, is not any better than what it is in adults. It is important that some adolescents will require testosterone therapy that can suppress sperm production. So if testosterone treatment is going to be needed for other reasons, for young Kleinfelter adolescents, we recommend at least unilateral one-sided sperm retrieval and freezing before starting that exogenous testosterone therapy. Some of the limitations I said before is the ability to use those frozen thawed sperm, but it's better to get something before you suppress sperm production going forward. So we treat many men with very severe forms of male infertility. Thousands of men have been treated here with sperm retrieval and that in vitro fertilization and ICSI process. Kleinfelter syndrome is at least 10% of the patients that we treat. That fertility treatment does require in vitro fertilization. Sperm retrieval in adults is common and is relatively uniformly successful, having again a 70% retrieval rate despite having no sperm in the ejaculate. The surgical approach for that is best done as a procedure we refer to as microtessy, but the management of couples um, are complex and need significant coordination together. For Kleinfelter syndrome adolescent patients, our approach is continuously evolving based on the information that we have. We like to assess the semen analysis early in adolescence. If testosterone is needed, then considering adjuncts, other medications to maintain sperm production is recommended. And again, if testosterone monotherapy is needed, considering upfront testicular sperm extraction and freezing for fertility preservation to preserve the ability to have children later is recommended. At this point, it appears that many, if not most Kleinfelter men may have optimal fertility potential if they're managed as adults. However, again, that is a process that we're continuing, continuously looking at and reevaluating um, as more information is gathered, particularly during the adolescent period. So again, I'm gonna be happy to take any questions and discuss some of these concepts in more detail. And I really thank you for the opportunity to present at this conference.